started again. Uh, five minutes was a bit, was not as fast as five minutes. Okay, let's close that one. But this is much nicer now for the, for this one. So, and let's go to full screen. Good, okay, we continue with Bayesian networks, okay? Just as a very brief reminder, so the motivation was <coughs> that probability distributions of already binary variables can get very memory hungry, right? So they need lots of numbers to really store. However, we know from our world knowledge that not everything depends on everything. So there might be some graphical structure behind. And this graphical structure is um, called a Bayesian network. So having a graph, a directed graph, which kind of tells us how the data is generated. So it's almost like a causal model. And actually, there are causal Bayesian networks. There's a lecture on this called causality, where one uses this kind of structure to model causal things. However, here we don't. We just use it for a clever representation. However, as it turns out, typically the causal directions, if you know them, right, they lead to a very efficient representation with few arrows. Okay, so there's some curious connection here, but which we are not going into. So somehow now we have graphs which kind of give us a way to factorize basically our joint distribution. So we factorize along the graph. So that is the idea. So basically the graph is telling us a node that doesn't have incoming edges, is not conditioned on anything, and you're always conditioned on your parents, okay? Which intuitively also makes sense. Curiously, the number of directed acyclic graphs you can have with four variables corresponds to the number of ways you can apply the product rule to a joint distribution. Or, alternatively, to the number of ways that you can permute those variables, okay? And then you use them in the ordering of the permutations. Good, so far so good. This is all very nice. Um, now the question was, um, looking at the graph, so it looks like there are these constraints that there's no direct connection between R and S, for example. So what does it mean on the probability side, okay? So what properties of the joint distributions are we talking about when we have such a graph? And it will be independence, which I explain in a second. And then more curiously it is, just by looking at the graph, which would be now something that your domain expert, yeah, the medical doctor, yeah, she looks at the graph and she could say, yes, that's how we do the reasoning. There is no connection between R and S. Yeah, that's basically how we would lay it out. How would I would lay it out in a textbook for medical students, okay? Um, however, what can we infer further from this? So some independencies are obvious, but there might be others, right? So if you look at this, uh, maybe the S and the J is also independent of each other. And that's something that you infer from the graph structure. So now the interesting question is, can we define properties on the graphs without talking about probabilities, but just about directed graphs, like computer science like to do, and then have a corresponding property in the world of probability? So kind of we want to connect it. That's a very interesting question. So. Towards that, let's first define what independence means between two variables. First of all, that's something that you have might seen before. So two random variables, A and B, are independent if their joint distribution factorizes. Okay? That's it. By the way, as I said at the beginning, if I write it like this, now I'm not saying this is only holding for A being true and not A for that it doesn't hold, but if I write it like this, I'm using a shortcut for the notation P of A being equal to 1, comma B equal to 1 is equal to something, and all other value combinations. So it should hold for all values. Doesn't have to be the way, right? I mean, it could be that there are some weird probability distributions where you have dependencies depending on the values. That's actually beyond our graphical model notation. It's more complicated than that. However, here we have this super simple case. Um, if we do parameter counting, it's also interesting. So somehow the, the P of A comma B, if those are binary variables, we would have three parameters, right? It's four possibilities minus one. And on the right-hand side, suddenly we only have two parameters, right? Which is kind of interesting. Actually, we can also talk about it more geometrically. Um, I'm not sure whether I should... Yeah, I should try to draw it. I mean, it's fun, so let's do it. So now we should see the... Boards, do we have chalk? N no chalk. Mm. 
So, um, by the way, curiously, um, you might know what a simplex is, right? So if we talk about this set of points here, they have a really nice property. Yeah? So if that is x and that is y, then those are exactly the point where y, x plus y is equal to 1. Okay? So this line here, these, they are all have this property that if you sum them up, they are equal to 1. Okay? So if this would be p of a being equal to 1, and this is p of a being equal to 0, yeah, then all these points on this finite intervals are basically possible probability distribution. So you could view this simplex here in this 2D space, you can view it like a representation of all possible probability distributions. Yeah? Actually, it's curious if you talk about it like this, what would be the right metric? You get, you get quickly into differential geometry and KL diversions and these kind of things. But we are not going there, just very intuitively. Now, how would it look in 3D, right? In 3D, um, it looks something like this. So those are three axes, and the corresponding simplex is basically this triangle that you see here, okay? They also have three numbers. If you sum them up, they are equal to one, okay? It's also a simplex. It's now a two-dimensional manifold. Manifold just means subspace, possibly curved, okay? Something that is locally like the R to the something. But for us, it's just like a, a 2D subset of this 3D embedding space. And of course, we could also go to four dimensions. Okay, and in four dimensions, how does the simplex look like? Can you guess what it is? Because, so here we are in 2D, and the simplex is one dimension less, and it's a line. Okay, here we are in 3D. And the simplex is one dimension less. It's a flat thing, a triangle. Now, in 4D, the simplex will be something three-dimensional. And any suggestion what the shape is? Exactly. And this is a tetraeder, OK? So this tetraeder is basically the simplex in 4D, okay, and why am I telling you? Because uh, let's draw it a little bit larger. Um, uh, now my drawing is, it was so good on my first attempt, so let me try it again. So there are different corners here, and when you look here, the, the corners were the extreme cases where one gets everything, right? Here, like the P of A equals one gets the full weight, here the other one gets the full weight. Here are three corners, basically a random variable with three possibilities, where in the corners, one of them gets all the weight, yeah, gets a one, and it can be distributed to the others. Here's a similar thing. So this is, would be a representation for two variables, where this corner corresponds kind of to probability like this. And there's a corner for A being equal to 1 and B being equal to 0. And here's another one. Which one am I, am I missing? I think this one. So what do I mean by this? Somehow, here it was every point on the line corresponds to a probability distribution. Here, every point on the 2D surface corresponds to a probability distribution for a random variable with three possibilities. And here, every point inside the tetrahedron corresponds to a probability distribution yeah, for two binary variables, for example, or for a single random variable with four possibilities. Okay? So now there's one point in the center, and that is the one where each of them get 0.25. They all get the same number. If I'm going to a corner, one of them gets everything, the other one gets zero, OK? Curiously, um, what I told you, there are three degrees of freedom for such a probability distribution. Thinking back of the independence, if I have two variables here, I said that it's something like p of a, comma b has three degrees of freedom, which corresponds to a 3D object, right, in which you could move around. Now, interestingly, if I assume that 
it factorizes like that, I only have two dimensions, so it should correspond to a subset in here, which is two-dimensional. And it's quite curious to plot it. Yeah, I could have prepared it. I have it somewhere on my laptop, but now I'm, I think I, I, I search it for 10 seconds. If I can't find it in 10 seconds, I won't show you, okay? So it is a surface in here, yeah, but it's a bended surface. And every point on this bended surface is a probability distribution where we have this factorization, okay? It's quite interesting, this geometric view. Um, so let's see whether I can find it quickly. Um, so I think I made it in this program here, in the Grapher program. So maybe it's in the recent files. Yes, it is. Who does it open? Oh, there it is. Okay, very nice. Uh, let me full screen it. And I think I need to switch now by hand. So what do we see? You see the tetrahedron here, right? So that is the tetrahedron that I made. By the way, the curious thing about the tetrahedron is that it's very naturally inside a cube. So you can take a cube, you chop off four of the corners, and you end up with a tetrahedron. And then you can define this very nice curved surface on it. And this is the so-called surface of independence, OK? A colleague of mine a while ago pointed this out to me, and I found it quite pretty that you can do it. And it's also very interesting. It's a manifold, right? It's not super trivial, this object anymore, but it's kind of interesting. In particular now, if you think about higher dimensional spaces with three variables, and you have a conditional independence, as we see, now there are also these weird things, right? And it's very hard to visualize. But in this case, you can still do it. So this is the surface of independence. So every point inside this tetrahedron is a probability distribution. And the one on the green surface are the ones that fulfill this criterion. OK, so it's a subset. It's a two-dimensional subset. It all fits nicely together. OK, so far so good. That's just for fun in a way, but maybe it gives some additional insight. Um, you could also rewrite this equation for the case that p of b is really greater than 0. You can also always rewrite it like this. OK, that just follows immediately from the definition of this conditional distribution. You can also do it the other way around and say p of b given a is equal to p of b. What's nice about it, it kind of shows you the independence in a different, uh, in a different um, way. Because you see that the distribution of a, if you condition on b, you have additional information on variable b, but you see that it doesn't matter. Okay, So you can just omit it. Okay, That's a nice statement that a and b are independent of each other. And you can show that it's symmetric. Um, we also use this notation here. So this is some notation that is commonly used with these Bayesian networks. So this is uh, easily shown. Also, if you assume this one, you can easily show that the right-hand side holds. However, this notation where you have the product of the two also holds if one of them is 0. Yeah? So it could be that p of s is equal to 0 p of s equals 1 is equal to 0, for example. And still, then, this independence can hold, because the equation holds, if the overall proper uh, thing is um, 0. And you cannot express it with that one, if p of s is equal to 0. So here is a super simple example. If you have two coins, I have two coins. Uh, I, I, it's so simple, I only tell it because there will be a more complicated example based on coins, too. So where's my money? Did someone take it? It's gone. Ah, no. So I think this is not on the video now because I'm out of the image. So here are the two coins. And um, the thing is, I'm throwing one coin yeah, over here. Well, I don't look at it. And then I throw the other one. And I see now it's the Brandenburg Gate. Okay, I don't know anything about the other one. So those two events are completely independent of each other. Okay, so that is the independence. I'm telling you in detail because now we get to a slightly different concept, conditional independence. I'm not sure whether this is typically covered in probability lectures in the math department, but it's the one that we need for this graphical stuff, okay, for the graph stuff. And this is conditional independence. And 
It is exactly the same thing, but all distributions are conditioned on some other event or on some other variable. That's it. That's conditional independence. So in a way, conditioning on the empty set, we get back to the previous one. Okay? So this is just a little bit more general. We also have a similar statement as before, but now everything conditioned on C. Um, so in light of information C, B doesn't tell us something about A. So that is the translation in words. Okay? So given that we know the information of C, we don't know anything. The one doesn't tell us about the other one. A simple example from the um, sprinkler network was Jack's grass and Tracy's grass, and there's the rain variable. Once we know whether it rained or not, knowing that Tracy's grass is wet doesn't tell us anything about Jack's grass. Okay? So only if we don't know whether it rained or not, then there's some information transfer going on. Okay? And there's also a simple example with two coins. So here are the two coins, and there's a bell. I used to do this with my cell phone, whether it was a bell app, but um, let's do it simpler. So it works like this. One random variable for one coin, one for the other one, and there's a third random variable now, which I ring if both um, show the same result, if both coins show the same result. Curiously, if I don't know anything, whether the bell was ringing or not, the coins are still independent, right? Curiously also, if I know the result of one coin, and I know the, um, uh, then this doesn't tell me anything about whether the bell will ring or not, right? Because it depends completely on the outcome of the other coin, which I don't. So also the other way around. However, curiously, once I know whether the bell rings or not, the two coins become dependent of each other, okay? And also, furthermore, curiously, also, the single coin and the bell become dependent on each other if I know the result of the other coin, okay? So it's subtle. And you see that it's also beyond the usual simple independence that we've seen on the previous slide. And it's already interesting for binary variables. However, of course, you could also write this all down for continuous variables. There it also applies, okay? It's also interesting in those cases. Good, so this is conditional independence. Of course, you can also define it for sets of variables, right? Instead of having a single variable, you could also have a set of variables. Fine. I hope that is not a surprise. I'm just using here different uh, letters to show that those are sets. And of course, then the previous definitions are special cases of the set one. I think that's also trivial. So um, let's get back to our uh, sprinkler example. So that was a setup. We got from our domain experts that this might be a useful factorization. Why is that one a particular useful factorization? Because here we know something about the factors. So we know something about the probability of setting up a sprinkler. We know something about the P of R. Of course, if we would use a different variable ordering, we would get a different factorization. But it might be very hard to come up with the proper probabilities from the domain expert. So it's good to have some ordering which typically corresponds to the causal ordering also kind of. So now, given this graph that kind of tells us this, what can we infer from the graph? So we did, we did say, like, hand wavily, um, it doesn't matter whether I condition or not. I would put in the same numbers anyway. So that was our reasoning to get rid of these uh, conditioned on some variable thing in the discussion last time. Um, now, could we do this more precisely now, using these notions of independence on conditional independence? And the answer is, of course, yes. And for this, we are looking at the simplest interesting path. So those are like very simple networks. They are just three variables, and we have all combinations, right? All going to the right, all going to the left, going like out, and both going in. And each of them corresponds to a different factorization, okay? So assuming this graph for the joint distribution allows me to factorize it in a particular way. In particular, it tells me there's no arrow going from A to C, so I can omit the A in the C conditioned on B, comma A, which would follow from the product rule always, right? But if that is my network and there is no arrow from A to C, then I can omit it here. And similarly for the other ones. So here one can show now that the following independencies hold. And the elementary proofs, I think, will be an exercise, okay? 
So now, how do you prove it? How do you prove that A is independent of C given B? Basically, you need to show that P of A, comma C given B factorizes in two um, other distributions. Okay, so that's it. And now, how do you prove it? You just um, have to plug in basically the joint distribution, and then you will see that everything turns out nicely. Okay, that you can do the right things. Okay, so it's really, really not super difficult. Okay, I hope that is approximately clear what to do. Okay, otherwise, please ask on Rocket Chat, and I give you more hints. Yeah, but basically, you need to um, have this bigger statement. Okay, I I tell you a bit about it, how to do it. So I want to make sure that every everyone can do it, and it's it's really not not super super difficult. So if we have um, this network, we have a particular factorization, as I said, and now in order to show A and C is independent given B, so I always use this to zeigen. If you like it, you can do it. Otherwise, you can also there are some other signs in some other languages, I guess. And then the proof basically starts with A and C given B. And then comes some derivations. And at the end, you want to have P of A given B times P of C given B. And you have to come up with that one. How do you do it? You use the definition of the conditional um, probability. There you will have the joint. You can plug in the joint. Okay. For the denominator, you have to use the sum rule first to get to the joint. Okay. And then you play around with it, and stuff cancels, and you can simplify it again back to this one. Maybe you need to extend it to get a second p of b in here or something. So, but typically, I think the p of b pops up automatically somewhere, and you can use it. Okay. So that's basically the structure of the proof. Okay, so far so good, and it's good to do it by hand, okay? Because then you really see how this um, graph assumption kind of leads to some independencies here. Curiously, these statements do not necessarily imply that A is independent of C, for example, in this case, right? Which is obvious in a way when you think about it, because the A will influence the distribution of the B, and the B will influence the distribution of the C, right? However, it says not necessarily. So sometimes A and C can be independent. And let me give you a very simple example where this is the case. Um, so suppose uh, the mapping from A to the middle variable is introducing, it's not changing the variable to be a pair, OK? And then we project onto the right hand side. Then this has the same structure A, arrow B, arrow C. But the weird thing is, I'm having a pair of something. So I'm having additional information here, which is somehow sampled somehow. Okay? And here I'm projecting the information out. So those two are dependent on each other. Those two are dependent on each other. However, A and B are independent of each other, possibly. Okay? So this is already a bit advanced, but yeah. I hope you, you get the idea. So it always depends also on the distributions. So these statements, they imply certain independencies, but they do not imply dependencies. Okay, That depends on the distributions. Good, so now what can we infer from this graph using these tricks? So first of all, j and t, given r, is independent, because here we have this path here yeah, that goes over these three nodes, and it's just the same as our A, B, C arrow. So it's the same ordering. So the arrows going pointing in the same direction as along J, R, T. Yeah? And here we can show in general that then A is independent of C given B. So for that reason, also J is independent of T given R. And we can say that R and S are independent. So that is the fourth case. And as you see, the fourth case is somewhat special. Yeah, so in the other three cases, no matter what, how the arrows go, we have always the same independencies. The outer ones are independent given the one in the middle, the one that's interrupting the flow of information, kind of. And here, curiously, even if we don't observe any information, then basically they are independent of each other. So that's basically the rain and the sprinkler. They are independent of each other, 
But when we observe that Tracy's grass is wet, suddenly they get dependent, right? Because if I know it's raining and the grass is wet, we have this explaining away effect, okay? And that's exactly what's happening at the V structure. So this is called a V structure because you have A and C and it's going down to the B. That's why it's called a V structure. It's also sometimes called a collider, okay? And there are others. There are more non-trivial ones. So for example, that one, uh, J and S. So J and S now is further away. We cannot directly apply this thing here, okay? Um, however, you could imagine that J and T is independent of each other. And since they are then directly connected, somehow that's not possible that there's information going here. But it's not super precise. So with these criteria up here, we can only talk about little groups of three variables. And of course, the question is, how can this um, be generalized? And it can be generalized with the so-called deseparation criterion, which I tell you next, okay? So the deseparation criterion, that's now a little bit a monster of a definition. It looks complicated, so we go through it step by step, okay? And it's maybe the most advanced stuff that I will tell you about Bayesian network in this lecture, okay? But it's super useful if you understand it. And you can make nice exercises with it. But I give you also an example. So let's first start at the end. So first of all, observe we are only talking here about a DAG, so about a directed acyclic graph. We are not talking about a Bayesian network. So this is a criterion on graphs. So we are now in graph theory, and we can forget for a while probability theory. However, it's defined in such a way that it will be compatible with probability theory, okay? So in particular, if we find something is deseparated in a graph, it should correspond to a conditional independency in the corresponding joint distribution, okay? So uh, let's start at the end. So two disjoint subsets of vertices, let's simplify that, two vertices, A and B, okay? So two nodes, A and B, are called deseparated by some third node or by a third subset of nodes if every path between those nodes is blocked by S. Okay, so that's the statement. So D separation, the D stands for directedness, so it's about a directed acyclic graph. So it's a separation criterion which takes into account the directions of the arrow. Of course, a simple um, a separation criterion would be just that any path between two nodes is kind of separated, but here it's more complicated. You have to look at the arrows. So you have, to you have to block all paths from A to B by this set. If that's the case, we write it like this. We use the same notation, but we have a sub G here. Where the sub G should tell us now something, this is a property of the graph. We are not talking about distributions. So now we need to define what does it mean that a path is blocked, okay? The good thing is, if you have a complicated graph, there might be two nodes, and there are many different paths between them. And deseparation now means all paths needs to be blocked, whatever that means. However, we kind of can now talk about a simpler situation where we only have a path, a single path between them, and we will say what does it mean to be blocked. When we've done that, then we completed the definition, okay? Then we know what to do. We have two nodes, we have to list all possible paths between them, and then we have to check whether all paths are blocked, okay? And then they are deseparated. That's it. And as I said, this is like a limit definition in infinitesimal rechnung or in analysis, right? Why? Because there you have this statement for all epsilon greater then zero, there exists an n such that for all numbers larger than n, kind of you're getting closer than epsilon to your limit. So it's a logical statement with for all something, there exists something. Same thing here, for all paths, yeah, there must be, there must a block, there exists a blockhead along the path, basically. So every path is blocked. So the existential quantifier comes in up here. So a path between two nodes is blocked by a set, yeah, Whenever there is a node, so this is the existential quantifier, yeah? so if there exists one entry along the way, such that one of the following two possibilities holds. So either the arrows of the neighboring nodes along the path yeah, are one of the first three cases, the one where we have conditional independence of two nodes given the middle one. 
if that happens along the path, we say the path is blocked. Okay? Or we have this V structure and we are not observing the node. Okay? So a path is blocked by observing one of the nodes, at least one of the nodes along the path, where we have this error structure, both to one side, both to the other side, both going outwards, or we are not observing basically the one where we have converging errors. Now I already mix up probabilities and graphs again. But basically, with observation, now I mean the set S, so blocked by a set S. So you can think of the set S as the stuff that we want to condition on, the stuff that we observe. Okay, so that's the definition. So if you have a problem, you look for all possible paths, and you need to say that they are all blocked. And if they're all blocked, then it's deseparated. Now there's one subtlety here, which is annoying, nor any of its descendants in S, okay? And that is the subtlety which kind of shows that it could be that the I sub K yeah, is not in your set S, but a descendant of it. And if that's the case, that location is not blocked. And I show you in the next slide some example where this will happen, okay? Good, so this is the definition. I hope you like it. So here's an example, looking almost like the exercise sheet that you have, okay? So um, hopefully I use the different ordering of the letters, otherwise the exercise is too simple, yeah? So where's the watch? Okay, so I'm slow, but this is an important, important topic, so let's do this. So what independencies can we draw can we infer just from the graph? And here now I'm already mixing notation. I omitted the sub G, okay? Because it really corresponds to independence for the variables. So A and D are independent given B and C because we need to block those two paths, the one going A, B, D, and we need to block the path A, C, D. Okay, those are the two, two paths that there are. And they are blocked by, by having B and C in our observation set or in this blocking set S, okay? So far, so good? You have a question? <coughs> ah. Okay, so first of all, now we are talking about A and node A and D. So we need to consider all possible paths going from A to D. And then for each of the paths, we need to show that they are blocked by our set S, which is this set. So this is the set S, given B and C. And so if I look at the first pass, it's one where both arrows going in one direction, and that one is blocked if the inner node is in my observation set, okay? And the same for the bottom one, okay? So far, so good? Okay, good, let's look at the next one. What about A and E? So that is also, there are two paths, one going up here and one going down here, and both are blocked with B and C. However, we can also block it just by having D in the set, then also both paths are blocked. Okay, so that's another option. And then there's also the question, what about B and C? So there are two paths. So one path is, of course, blocked by observing A. However, the other one is only blocked, so that is a V structure, if we do not observe the D, nor any of its descendants. So here, the D should not be observed, so it should be not conditioned on. Otherwise, it's open. Otherwise, we have the situation with Jack's graph. Now, I think it was Tracy's graph, and we have the sprinkler and the rain. And they are actually independent if we don't observe Jack's graph, but if we observe Jack's graph, we can have this explaining away effect. Okay? So, we are not allowed to observe D. What about the E? It's a descendant. So, Jack's graph, okay, we didn't observe it, yeah? But we've seen that when I went into the house, I've seen that my, my shoe were wet, okay? And so my shoes being wet is a descendant of the lawn being wet, and so it gives me some information, and so suddenly I have the explaining away effect, okay? So if I have some information about the D, maybe not full information, but some information, then this path is open and they are not deseparated. That's this nor any of its descendant bit, okay? Good, and there are more, okay? I list them here. On the next slide, I try to list all possible answers. So sometimes you need all permutations here. So for C and E, for example, you can block it by D, you can block it by D and A, or by D and B, or by D, A and B, okay? They are all possible. Then they are all possible 
independence sets. I hope I didn't miss one. If I miss one, please tell me, okay? So please check on the exercise whether you got the idea. So if I would do the exercise now, if I would were you, I would put this slide away. I would do the exercise by using the definition on the previous slide, and then I compare results with the solution, basically. So it's very similar to the solution here, okay? Question? Uh, I mean that we know the value. Yeah, right, exactly. And I'm mixing it already up this because they are so related, but actually it's about this blocking set S. So the blocking set S is the stuff we will condition on. It's also in the notation already the same thing. Yeah, okay. Another question? What do you mean by using brackets? Um, because the order of, uh, of all the um, the operations, uh, because if you have if you have the structure B and C, yeah, and you condition them on B, yeah, and then you see that you have B dependent with A, yeah. I'm not, I'm not super sure, so, but uh, let me tell you how I would write it down. If I, have a, if I want to prove such a statement, I would first list all possible paths, and then for each path, I would say that my set S is blocking them. And then I have shown the for all statement. Okay, sorry. So, but what do you mean by the ordering or the order? Ah, I see what you're saying. Ah, yeah, it's again a binding problem. So how would, how would you put brackets? So um, these things need to be put in brackets. Yeah. So basically, this weird operator with this bar and the bar, that's a ternary operator that has three inputs. So one input is A and possibly more variables. The second input here is D. And the third input is B, comma C. Ah, OK. No, you could, you could use brackets, of course. It doesn't change anything. In a way, a bracket is just an operation, right, that is kind of mapping a, a, a random variable on another random variable, right? If you have two random variables, the pair of the two random variables is yet another random variable with a different range. OK, I see. OK, good question. It's a, also, the LaTeX is doing the spacing here un, uh, unclear, so it's not, not so clear where it stops and where it ends. But if you see this, Thing, there are always three parts. This is the first one, this is the second one, and then behind the bar, everything is then in the third pa part. Okay? Okay, good. This one? Uh, yes. That one? Ah, and if there is a direct connection, they are already dependent on each other. You cannot infer. You can only infer something from missing arrows. No. It sh you made it. Okay, let's look at it after the lecture. Okay, let's have a look, and then we can check it out on the board, and we do some calculations, and we, we will see. But I think you can't. Okay. 
Uh, let's discuss it. Sounds interesting. I mean, yeah, let's have a look at it. Uh, def definitely, we need to uh, look at these things. OK, any more questions? Yeah. No. For example, if you have the fully connected graph, there are no arrows missing. And so you won't find a path um, where you can, can use this. You will always find a path that kind of, so suppose there's also connection from ik minus 1 to ik plus 1. Suppose there's a direct connection. It would mean that would maybe even this path, so this path along i sub k is blocked by i sub k, but there is a shortcut. So there is another path then to bypass it. So in a fully connected graph, Yeah, then there's typically an independence. If there are arrows missing, then you have independencies. So if you have a fully connected graph, you cannot say anything about the independencies. There might be some, but you don't see them in the graph. And if there are arrows missing, this is introducing independencies. Also, curiously, it's monotonic, right? If you remove more arrows and more arrows, you can only get more independencies. None of them gets invalidated. I think this is a true statement. This is something to think about. But I think that is true. Yeah. OK, any more questions? Yeah, OK. Good. So far, so good. So this is the, the example, right? And I think if you understand this slide, then you are well prepared. And the deseparation is, is not simple, right? So this is really a bit tricky. And you have to go through it by. And it's also not convenient. You really have to go through all paths. So there is no quick solution to this one. You really have to go through it. It's, it's screaming for being mechanized, right? And there actually is a, a package DAGIT, yeah, DAG -IT. It's a website, I think, where you can go and where you can put some graphs and then you get it for free automatically. So you can play around with it or make your homework with it. But you should be able to do it without DAGIT, okay? So similarly here now, what can we infer now with our, our gain superpowers here? So we can talk about J and T. We have said already, because the path from J to T is deseparated by observing R, great, and so on and so forth. More examples, more worked out. OK, so maybe let me omit it now. Good. There is an interesting link between graphs and distribution, but um, it's not super simple. So there is the so-called, if you have a graph and a joint distribution, and if you have um, satisfies, I don't know, did I phrase this wrong? Given a deck, a joint is satisfies the global Markov property, blah, 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 the local Markov property. So these are all equivalent. I need to rephrase it. So if you have a joint distribution that satisfies one of them, OK, then it will also satisfy the other ones. So they are all equivalent. So what does it mean? One is the so-called global Markov property with respect to the DAG. So the distribution P, I will revert it, has the global Markov property with respect to the DAG if all these separation situations in your graph imply a conditional independence with respect to the distribution, OK? So that is one thing. And then there's a local Markov property, which is equivalent to the first one, also with respect to the, to the DAG. If each variable is independent of its non-descendants given its parents, OK? That's also something that one can show. And we won't show it. I just want to give you like a slide where it's more precisely said how the relation between the graph and the distribution is. And you see. There are some subtleties. Yeah? In particular, if you know some condition independencies in your probability distribution, it doesn't mean that you will have the correct missing arrows in your deck. So it's not going the other way around. Okay? And then there's the so-called Markov factorization property, which says that your distribution is factorizing along the graph. Okay? So that's yet another one. But you, you don't have to be able to prove any of these. Yeah? Ideally, you understand them what they mean, OK? Ah, OK. Um, the, oh, I see what, what I, for my phrasing. So the first one is a definition. It's not a theorem. So we say that given a DAG, a joint distribution P satisfies the global Markov property. If this holds, it satisfies the local Markov property. If the next one holds, and so on. 
And then we have the theorem that all of these are equivalent. If, it, if you have one, you have all others. Okay, so the wording is fine. Good, so far so good. Um, so here's an example for the theorem. Basically, again, the distribution that we defined is Markovian with respect to the graph. That's just how we defined it. And if either, in this case, the global Markov property holds, so that is basically these independent statements must hold, yeah, or we have a factorization, for example, which is also by definition. Yeah? So this is just applying it to what we just did. But the statement is general, and it applies also to more complicated graphs. So far, so good. So we've seen that a joint distribution can be very efficiently represented using graphs. Okay, So that is basically exploiting condition independencies between variables. It's also a good way to think about distributions. If you have domain knowledge, it's good to draw your graph. Okay, So that's kind of very useful yeah, to do. Because then it's kind of simplifying, it's kind of reducing the complexity of your probability distribution, if you can define it along a graph. And as computer scientists, we are super happy because then we can sample along the graph, which is like, oh, let's have an object for every of the nodes. And every node kind of has some input. And once you get the input, you can trigger some output and pass it on to your children. And kind of you can imagine that this can be nicely implemented also in a programming language where each node is an object and it can listen to messages and it can spawn its own messages. Okay, so that's kind of nice. Yeah, so that's a good thing. The main idea here is to combine probabilities and graphs. Good, so far so good. Any more questions here? Then let's go on to the next section. Um, let me see how I can switch here. Let's move on to section five. Am I still recording? Yeah. Why should it stop? So, OK. Next, we continue with continuous variables. OK, so how can we now define probabilities on continuous variables? You know already you need measure theory and you need all of the thing. Here comes a super basic way to define it. It's a bit hand wavy, but curious. It's not from me. I think it's also from E.T. Jane's book. And it's kind of interesting. In his book, he's happy with um, having everything finite, OK? And that's very useful, because then the math, you don't have to, com you don't have to worry about Swan's lemma or some other weird axioms which you might argue they are wrong or something, OK? So you keep everything simple. with with finite stuff. And so it's also curious that you can define probabilities for continuous variables with finitely many um, events, basically. Interesting. In a way, it's a hack. Yeah, Maybe it's not super rigorous, but E.G. James is allowed to do it. He's a physicist, so he can do these things. And we are computer scientists. We are also finite, right? No matter whether you buy the latest super duper laptop, your memory will be finite always, right? It will grow with the years but it will stay finite. So how do we do this? Let x now be a real valued random variable, OK? So, but think about it as being a variable. Let's define some propositions, because then we can use propositional um, definitions, so, uh, probabilities on propositions. So here's a proposition which says x is less than or equal to a, to some constant a, OK? Here's another event, x is less than or equal to b. And here's a combined event, which is like A is inside this interval. And those are three events, OK? Finitely many only. However, of course, A and B are coming from a continuum. And so in a way, we have um, uncountably many events if we really want to make it precise. But if we actually do it practically on a piece of paper, we always have only finitely many, and everything is fine. So those are events. Now note that the event set of B, so being less than, less than this little letter B, is basically the event set of the formula A or W. Okay? So either being less than this one or being basically in this interval. So those event sets are exactly the same. Curiously, the event sets of A and W are mutually exclusive. So not both of them can be true. You are either in the interval or you are smaller than this little letter A. So we can apply the sum rule, OK? And I am just reordered it already. Actually, it's P of A plus P of W being equal to P of B. 
Now let's have an interesting definition. Let's call capital F of x defined to be the function of P of x less than or equal to x. And here again, it, we, we are a bit cheating, right? Here we are talking about infinitely many events, capital X being less than little x, because x is a real number. But we are only writing down finitely many. So everything is called. Oh, it's a bit a hack. And then we define the little f to be the derivative of this function, right? Sure, we can do this. And then we get basically that the probability of being in the interval, which is the probability of w, okay, is now the probability of b minus p of a, where we now plug in the f, okay, so we get that one. And then we use the result for an analysis. This can be rewritten like the integration over my derivative, okay, from a to b. It's quite curious, this derivation. Now this f is called the cumulative distribution function, and the little f is called the probability density function. Yeah, so that is a tricky, interesting way how to do it. And at this point, it stops already, the fun de derivation. However, it has all the nice properties, and it's just how it should be, yeah? I say a bit more hand-wavy things. So in a way, this is not a super rigorous foundation of what we want to do, but it's like a fun foundation. So probability theory um, being an extension of propositional logic. So how did we do that? We started with a finite set of propositional variables here. So just to give you an overview. Um, and we have a sample space, which are all Boolean assignments, OK? And then we had a probability mass function basically defined like that for all possible realities. And that was defining everything we needed. However, in discrete probability theory, often it's also done slightly differently. You might have a random variable ranging over a discrete set. So recall, here the Boolean assignments were only finitely many, OK? But in principle, it could be countably infinitely many events, right? A distribution over the natural numbers. Then typically in mathematics, you would say the sample space are now the natural numbers, and we have a probability mass function with this property. However, this gets already more complicated because here you have already an infinite summation. But let's not, excuse me, not worry about it. And then there's a third one, a random variable ranging over a continuous set, for example, the real numbers. There the sample space is R, and um, we will have a probability density function going from the sample space to the real numbers, and it must integrate to one, okay? So those are like the three different situations. Again, at the end, we only care about product rule and sum rule, okay? And at least if those, if we can use those, then we can do our calculations, everything we want to do. But this, why do I write it down? Because like the way we did it up here for the finite one is still slightly different for the discrete one, because here we can have infinitely many, and it's very different one from the continuous. Um, so here again an overview. So a probability measure basically define uh, it measures the mass of a subset of my sample space, and so here it would be the natural numbers. For example, we have these notions with the summation with the small letter p. And in this case here, we typically have a large letter P for the probability where we sum everything up. Um, OK, this is just different notation. However, curiously, for the PDFs, we have also the product rule and the sum rule. And I write this here as a theorem, because it can be actually derived from the way we typically write things down. OK, when I first saw this, I was really surprised. So Bayes' rule holds also for continuous densities, yeah? not for the probabilities themselves, but for the densities. That's how you can basically combine prior and likelihood and these kind of things. OK? So since we have the product rule and one can show this, OK, for that reason, often we use a little p for the PDFs. And we could have a PDF p of x and another PDF p of y, we also use the same convention that if we use a different letter, it might be a different PDF. That's something statisticians typically not do. They would say f is the density of x, g is the density of y, OK? But it's super useful notation. Here's yet another way. Yeah, so this is an hand wavy motivation for probabilities. And if you trust these hand wavy explanations, they should give you at least some insight, OK? This is not pure math. 
So another way to think about it is, consider you have three variables with some values, and somehow we need some joint PDF, right? That's typically the starting point when you do probabilistic inference. So suppose you have a domain expert, yeah, and he gives you a distribution for the C, a distribution for P given C, and for P of A given B and C. For example, the P of C could be a Gaussian distribution, standard normal, for example. We will introduce what that is in the next lecture. Um, and maybe condition on the value of C, we have another Gaussian distribution, right, where now the C is influencing the mean or the variance, and then and so on and so forth. So that kind of makes sense that there's a domain expert and uh, he could give us these things. And then we could just define yeah, the joint by multiplying all of these. So why is it a good idea? Because then kind of we get the product rule for free, right? The product rule then follows from defining the joint in that way, okay? We can also define all other partial joints now by, by integration, yeah? So the question is, how do we get something so why should the product rule and the sum rule tr be true? Why is the theorem true? And on this slide, I show you a simple way how you could set up your problem and combine the bits and pieces, basically multiplying these univariate distributions to get a bigger joint. And then by definition, everything holds at the end. Okay, so this is just how it has to be. So by integrating out variables, we can define now the partial joints and then for free, all sum rules will hold. So they are not derived, it's very hard, I find it very hard to derive them kind of from the definition of my continuous variable that was fishy anyway, right? But there is a way to set up your problem that you can be sure that the sum rule holds if you do it like that. Um, similarly, we can define the conditional PDFs as quotients, yeah? And curiously, these definitions also work out for the ones that we plugged in. And then we have also the product rules for all of this. And everything is compatible with, with each other. I think there's a theorem in Wahrscheinlichkeitstheory and probability theory that if you have like a product space and you go to some subspace, like, like integrating one of them out, you get yet another measure for the sub product space and everything must be compatible with each other. So it shouldn't matter whether you first sum out the first variable, then the second variable, the result should be the same if you first sum out the last variable and then the second one or something like this. So there is a compatibility theorem. And this is in a similar spirit, okay? So everything is nice. At the end, we just need to store, somehow we can trust the product rule and the sum rule. And we can apply to the PDF or we can apply to discrete um, variables. Okay, so far so good. Um, Let's try to define now more precisely, slightly more precisely, what a random variable is. So a discrete random variable x is some variable with some values, little x, that's my notational convention, where the little, little x is ranging over some discrete set curly x, okay? However, that is not enough. My discrete random variable also comes with a probability mass function. So it's not only knowing its range, it also knows its distribution. So if in, in Java you define a data type and you say now I have a record or I have a, a class which has an integer and a date and a string, right? Then you're only giving the range of your data type. You're not giving a distribution. So in that sense, a Java class that you're defining is not a random variable because it doesn't come with a distribution. Only if you include somehow the distribution into your data type, then it's a random variable, okay? And you can do the same thing for a continuous random variable, where here now we are defining the PDF instead of the probability mass function. Good. Um, one word about this range of a random variable. This is also just two possible interpretations. Yeah, so either we just call this curly x the range of x, that's one possibility, or we consider only the subset of the x where my density or my probability is greater than zero. Just sometimes people are using the second definition, but then it gets really inconvenient if you want to, if you are in a situation where you want to talk about all possible values, even if some of them are impossible. So both kind of is a range. Sometimes we use one, sometimes we use the other definition. What else do we have? Yeah, random variables, as you've seen already, are denoted by capital letters, its values by small letters. And by this, let me stress it again, so the small letter 
it only has a range, right? It's a real number without a distribution. And the capital X, it is like it has a certain range and it has a distribution, okay? So why is it important? Again, in Java, if you compare two objects from a class, you need to define equality somehow, right? And we would, if we do not include the distribution into our data structure, then two random variables would be the same if they are both having a real number in there, right? However, we are saying they are only the same if they have also the same distribution. So if one has a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and the other one has a Gaussian distribution with mean one, those two objects are different, okay? So it's part of a random variable. Um, okay, I said that already a thousand times. Um, again, we are using this convention, which is super useful, that we have capital letters for the variables and small letters. And that is super useful if we are writing P of X, we know already we are talking about a random variable capital X, right? And if we have P of Y, yeah, that's a weird thing, but it's super useful then to say this is a different density, yeah, or a different probability. Good, so far so good. Um, yeah, side note, what is really a random variable? Just for the people who know it already, so in mathematics, um, a random variable is a measurable mapping from some sample space, which in my lectures, when I was a student, nobody talked about so much what it's really is this omega. The omega is just some gigantic thing, which is so gigantic that everything that we can measure kind of is possible to map from it, okay? But it's unclear. The only thing we're assuming for this omega is that we have a probability measure P on it, okay? So some, some of the omega is something like the reality world, so the whole world, and it has a certain distribution, okay? And now if I have a real number, if I want to sample whatever the length of my feet from it, yeah, then a random variable is a mapping from this space to the real numbers, okay? And now where is the distribution? We get it for free, since we can just define for some subset of my real numbers, I could say the P of E, the probability for this event, is basically the probability on my sample space omega, yeah, where I plug in basically the inverse of my mapping, okay? So that's how it's done. However, we can have it simpler. We just say X has a range of real numbers and we have a PDF for it, okay? That's easier than to talk about the X being a mapping, okay? There is something, does every random variable has a PDF? Every continuous variable, the answer is no, yeah? So it needs to be absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure, okay? So far, so good. There must be a definition for this. It's just a nice property and everything that we are doing has nice properties, so we don't worry about it. We always have a PDF, okay? In everything that we do, we have a PDF, and that's how we represent our real valued or continuous random variables. But there is a world where you can also think about it that they don't have it sometimes, okay? For example, a discrete random variable doesn't have a PDF. It's an example where this is, this is not the case. In our lecture, so we always have PDFs, and um, yeah, basically that's the thing that I already said a thousand times. I think in all lecture halls, the clock is on the left-hand side, only in this one, okay? That's why I'm always looking to the side. Good, um, for us, the random variable can have any type, okay? In particular, x could be a function, which is super useful when we talk about Gaussian processes, okay? So in a way, in that sense, we sometimes are, we can allow ourselves to be a little bit more generous with, with what's possible and with having the foundations maybe not laid out super strict, okay? Good, so far so good. I want to show you some code, but let me first, last thing for today, I just want to introduce expectations, yeah? That's very quick, and then I show you some code, okay? So, expectations. That's maybe for the most people a repetition. The motivation for expectation is that you could have a, a weighted average, right? You sum out possible values, x sub i, and you weight each of them. And you can also do it with a function, right? You can have an integration over some variable x. And that's basically the idea of having expectations. We're having a weighted average where we weight our different values now with our probability. So that's it, okay? So it's a weighted average. Basically, the one the, where the p of x is large, those values get a bigger weight than the ones that are very small. For example, if you take the length of the feet here in the room, right, 
there is probably no one that has like 100 centimeters long shoes. Uh, maybe there is one, but I don't think so. Um, so it gets a very small weight, right? And maybe 45 gets a higher weight, and so on and so forth. And then you could calculate the average. I think you are all familiar with that one. And as a notation, we write this capital letter E in front of it. And again, as computer scientists, so what's this type of the E? The type of the E is interesting. So the E takes a random variab variable, right? Random variable means it's a variable with a range and with a distribution. And then it collapses it on one of the values from its range. So that is what the E operator is doing. Okay, it takes a random variable and generates a value with a certain property. We could also have it slightly more general. We could have an expectation of a function f with respect to a discrete random variable or a continuous one. So basically, we could have any expression behind the e. Yeah? However, it's only interesting if there's a random variable inside. So if there's a random variable inside, we replace it now with this little x and average it out, again, weighted with the p of x. OK, so that is like the expectation of a function of x. Now, the function could also be 0 times x, of course, which means that the random variable is disappearing. OK, so what would happen? So basically, if we have part of the expression that does not depend on my random variable, I can drag it out. So the expectation is a linear operator. So I can drag out scalars, for example. Yeah? And then, depending on what remains, it will be 0, or it could be 1, the remaining thing. So this is also possible. Good, so far so good. Sometimes we also write e sub x. Let me not tell you here the details. Here are a couple of interesting expectations. There's a mean, yeah, which is just the expectation of the identity function. Yeah? So the more general point of view is the expectation of a function. Then there's the expectation of this weird-looking function x minus mu in bracket squared. And if the mu is actually the mean, yeah, in that case, the whole thing is a variance. So the variance is also just an expectation with a more interesting function. OK? So far, so good. You can also do some fun stuff. You can write the product and some rule kind of in one formula. So you can have the expectation of p of little y given capital X. Yeah, so this is interesting. So basically, the little y is the value. The capital X is here the random variable. So that is the one where I'm taking my expectation with. Okay, That's why I'm having a sub x here. And then when you write it out, basically here now you have another, you can apply the product rule to get the joint. Okay, And then you can get rid of the integration. You have p of y. So in the p of y being equal to the expectation of this one, kind of you have the product and the sum rule kind of um, built in, which is, I think it's nice. Also, probabilities can be seen as expectations. So if you have an event set A and you're asking what's the probability of X being in this A, it's curious it's the, if it's the expectation of the indicator function. Okay? Or if you like Iverson brackets, as I do, Iverson brackets are just translating true and false value into 1 and 0. Okay? Then you could also write it as the expectation over the Iverson brackets. So the expectation is not super boring, OK? So there's something interesting going on here. Good, so far so good. Let's go to an inference example, inferring the probability of wearing glasses. I have it from a colleague, Philip Hennig, of mine. He had this nice example, and this is a worked out version. I'm using different notation, and I'm also now using different code for the demo, but the example is from him. So the question is now, having lots of people in here, what's the probability that a person wears glasses, OK? And we have observations. And then we can apply Bayes' rule as the first thing. Maybe I don't know anything. So the probability, I would say maybe, OK, I'm assuming a uniform distribution over all possible values from 0 to 1. And then I'm seeing the first person, no glasses. And then this will change my prior distribution to a posterior distribution. And then I'm seeing the next one, also no glasses, and so on and so forth. And so after each observation, I'm updating my belief about this thing, OK? And that's what we are modeling next. So I will model the probability, that is the unknown, to wear glasses as a random variable. And this is now not very non-frequentist. In frequentist world or in classical statistics, you wouldn't 
say a parameter is a random variable, right, that you can do inference about. Typically in classical statistics, the parameter is fixed and you can write down estimators that have good properties, okay? Here we are Bayesian now today and we are saying it is a random variable. I don't know it, so it's probably having a distribution. And I'm starting with my prior distribution and then I'm using Bayes rule for inference. So here are five observations. So I'm writing them x1 to x5 and they are like true and false or one and zero or something. Um, so why is one value between zero and one? Since it's a probability, yeah, so it must be between zero and one. And the other ones, my observations are binary. So it's zero and one. And I can have a nice Bayesian network for it to explain the structure of my setup. So there is this possibly unknown random variable y. And given that I know the variable y, I have a certain distribution for x1. And also I have a certain distribution for x2, and so on and so forth. So curiously now, let's use our deseparation powers on this graph. We could say x1 and x2 are independent of each other, given that I know my parameter y. Okay, so if the first person has glasses and the second person I don't know, if I know the probability that a person wears glasses, then the information from the first observation doesn't tell me anything, right? Because they are independent of each other given that I know the parameter. Yeah, that's a slightly different way of thinking than like in classical statistics. In particular, we could say um, the parameter kind of renders the observations independent of each other. That's surprising because classically you would say they are IID, right? They are independently, identically distributed. And here they are, but we could make the independence a bit more precise. They are independent given the parameter. If I don't have the parameter and I've seen five people with glasses, of course this tells me a lot about the sixth person, right? Because if they all had glasses and they're coming somehow from the same distribution, it would change my belief about the sixth person. So the variables are not independent if I don't have a parameter. But given a parameter, they are independent, okay? So this just as a side note for the graphical representation. Again, we are using capital and small letters. We have a certain prior for my y, yeah? Fully we would write it like p of capital Y being equal to little y. And then we have a likelihood function, which is basically our measurement function. So given my letter, my probability y, which is something, let's say, 0 0.7, yeah? My likelihood is then just the Bernoulli distribution. So it's just the probability um, the, to see glasses. So this likelihood is just equal to y, okay? That's it. So it's just this probability, or 1 minus y, depending on the value of xi. Typically, the likelihood, why it, by the way, doesn't have a different name, and why is it not called a probability? If we talk about likelihood, we typically view it as a function of the second parameter. Yeah, so that's it. Probabilities are always normalized and sum up to one. That's the case if we sum up over the first argument. But if we sum up over the last argument, it does not have to sum up to one, okay? And then we would call it a likelihood. Good, so far so good, so let's look at this. So probability of wearing glasses without any observations is just my P of Y. And the probability of wearing glasses after one observation is now multiplying the likelihood to my prior divided by the evidence, which I'm now just abbreviating with some variable z. It's something I don't want to calculate. I'm multiplying the likelihoods to each other, yeah, and um, then have to properly normalize them. But that's not where the shape of the function changes. It's just rescaling such that the integration is one. Good. Now, if I have two observations, I'm basically multiplying basically this. So if I just write it out using the product rule, I would get this expression. However, x1 and x2 are independent given my y that I know from my graphical model. So I can omit it and I can this thing here, which is the usual way we write things down if we have IID data. We would say that it's factorizing in the different ob observation. It's the same thing. And so on and so forth. So basically, I have a certain prior, and then I multiply it with each of the likelihoods. It's also showing me here, since the um, product is like associative, now it's commutative, 
So it doesn't matter in which order I do my product. It doesn't matter in which order I get my observations. Okay, it's the same thing. Good, so far so good. Let's write down the likelihood. The likelihood is just y if x1 is equal to 1. Okay, then it's just p, yeah, probability of throwing heads. And 1 minus p or 1 minus y in this case if I have the other value. Okay, so this is a binary variable. So there are only two numbers. Let's introduce some helpful random variables. Let's count the number of observations being 1, wearing glasses, and let's count the number of observations being 0, not wearing glasses. Okay? And then we have like a nicer notation. Because then we could write p of y as a posterior simply by writing y to the n and 1 minus y to the m, okay? just by collecting these terms. Um, I go a bit over time. I hope you don't mind, but then we will have the nice demo already today, okay? If you have something else, you can leave, so that's no problem from my side. Okay, so that is now the form of my posterior, okay? So after seeing five observations, my posterior looks like that, okay? Now, what prior p of y would make the calculation super easy, yeah? It would be super easy if it would have a beta distribution. So that's a weird motivation for choosing your prior, right? Because actually you should choose your prior because it's expressing your inner beliefs before seeing any observations. However, typically priors are chosen in such a way that the math works out very nicely, okay? And for that reason, we are choosing here some beta distribution with parameter a and b. And um, curiously, um, the a being equal to 1 and the b being equal to 1, yeah, we will have p of y being equal to 1. So we will have the uniform distribution. So the beta distribution is the uniform distribution if the parameter is chosen to be a being equal to 1 and b being equal to 1. So there is a normalization factor, so this z, and that is the beta function, which you might have heard already before. Okay? If you haven't heard about it, so it's just exactly what we need. Yeah, we need to normalize y to the a minus 1 times 1 minus y to the b minus 1. So we need to normalize this by integrating out basically over the y. So let's do that, and that is exactly the beta function. Okay, that's a curious motivation for the beta function, where it's coming from. Um, okay, I said that already, so it's a uniform distribution. Here's just a small slide on gamma function, beta function, and all this stuff yeah, for your pleasure. So there's this gamma function, and there's the beta function, and there's a the relationship between them. So when you see this integration in analysis, that this is the so-called gamma function, and it has super, super nice properties, I found it really hard to derive it from e to the minus t and t to the z minus 1. I can't do it. However, one can show that the gamma function is the same as the factorial on the integers. Okay? So some of the gamma function is a continuous the continuization of the factorial function. Okay, great, sounds cool. And of course, you can also do the same thing with the binomial coefficient, this m plus n div uh, over n. Yeah, that is basically generalized to all possible numbers using the beta function. And as you know, there's this formula with factorials also for the binomial coefficient. You have something similar for the gamma function and the beta function. Okay, however, it should just show you where it comes from. It's a nice normalizer for the density we want to look at, okay? But we don't have to worry about it. We use a table lookup, yeah? We don't have to be able to compute. I think that's also how you do it. You don't have a closed form solution for this integration. I think you, you have a big table and you store it in your computer and that's how it's computed, okay? So far, so good. So the density of my beta distribution looks like this. And you can plug in A and B any real numbers, okay? I think super negative is not allowed. I think they must be greater than zero, okay? So that's, I think, what you need to plug in. Good, the likelihood is this one in our nice notation. If, if we combine it, the so posterior will be Z1. And as it turns out, this is yet another better distribution. So your prior is a better distribution and your posterior is also a better distribution. And if that's the case, we say that we have a conjugate prior for the likelihood, okay? 
So some things work out very nicely. For example, having a prior a Gaussian distribution. If your likelihood is an also Gaussian distribution, then your posterior will be a Gaussian distribution. So your prior was a Gaussian, your posterior is a Gaussian. They are conjugate to each other. And there are many combinations. And I think you can click on that one. I just did. And here you will see a big list of conjugate distributions that are conjugate to each other, which work out nicely, where the mass is nice. OK? Good. So that's it, basically. Let me show you the code, OK? So we wanted to see this implementation. And there are also some gimmicks in there again. So today, now, I'm using these IPy widgets toolbox, which is also fun. So there you can get sliders and buttons and stuff in your notebook, which I found super useful. However, to get it, it took hours to implement this because the documentation is kind of, uh, was too difficult for me. I'm again using Plotly. So let's run it. I just run the whole notebook. And you can have a look at it, run all. So good that I'm using the low resolution. Otherwise, it couldn't run. So first, I have here some, some notes about the beta distribution. So here's my implementation, just using the formulas from the slide. I'm using the beta function from the SciPy um, library. And here, I'm comparing my implementation of the beta PDF with the beta PDF that comes from the SciPy. So in SciPy, there's a beta function in here, and there's also a beta distribution in here, which you can use to plot the PDF or the CDF. And I'm comparing it here. And it's nice that they come out the same. Why is it interesting to do? Why is it a good starting point? Because it kind of sh shows that the formulas that we wrote down in the slides are really correct, like the implementation you have in these toolboxes. Um, then there's some, some fun stuff with these IPy widgets. You can have this interact decorator in front of your up, some update function. You can look at the code in detail. But what you can do now, you can slide these things back and forth, and you get like a nice update of this function, right? So you can plug in different values for a and b, and you see how the distribution changes and how the mean and the variance changes, OK? So this is just nice to get a feeling for these things. Um, then comes the varying glass. So that's an even more complicated one with buttons. And this is now showing you the prior distribution. So we just have a uniform distribution from 0 to 1. And now here I'm having buttons, and we can update it. And now I'm starting over here. So no glasses, OK? So this is my posterior distribution after seeing one observation, OK? The next one, no glasses again. Ha! Huh. It's changing its shape. Curious, now it's curved. The likelihood they are all straight lines. But when you multiply a straight line with a straight line with a straight line, you get something curved. OK? Why? Because you're getting a polynomial, right? You're multiplying linear functions with each other. So here, in every observation, I'm multiplying one more linear function to my current posterior. And by this, increasing the degree of my polynomial that describes it. Next one still doesn't have glasses. OK? And then comes the first one with glasses. And now it's kind of shifting, OK? So now it still would say, um, yeah, I'm probably 0 0.3. And that would be your point estimate from classical statistics. Yeah, you would say it's 3 quarters or 0 0.25, 1 minus 3 quarters in this case, yeah, to wear glasses. And that is a value over here, yeah? And it is probably, I think it's the mean of the whole thing, yeah? But here you also see that you cannot be so sure yet, because it's still a quite wide distribution. So if you would like to get a feeling what the true probability is, you could sample from this distribution and generate samples. But let's go on. So next one, without glasses, no glasses. So it's shifting a little bit to the left, OK? No glasses, then comes glasses, no glasses, and so on and so forth. Let me do this a bit more speedy. So let's put 20 people in here. Yeah. Oops, now I'm shifting to the other side and 30 people over there. And now you see that the posterior gets more and more um, having a smaller variance. So the variance is getting smaller. And we are getting closer to the true values that ideally are also the ones that the frequentist would calculate. So what is this number now? So basically, it's like, with glasses, 20 divided by 50. 
So it's like two fifths, and two fifths is 0 0.4, which is exactly Z1. So that is the mean. And we see that it's getting um, further um, concentrated around one point. And the more observations I have, the variance is going down, OK? So this is Bayesian inference. And I think it's really pretty, and it's kind of intuitive. It's also like we think about things, that maybe we are sure about something, and then after seeing more observations, we are even more sure. Good. Um, also, you can have a look at the implementation if you like to. So you, have, you need some widget. You need to do some, some plotting. And then basically, you define some buttons. And depending on the button, you call your update function with certain events. That's how you implement something like this. When you see it like this, it's su looking super simple. But until you get there, it takes a lot of time. OK, so that's it for today. Sorry for going over time. Yeah, next time, I think we will be in time again. Uh, I see you on Monday, and have fun with the exercises.